2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. Hey, we're going, uh, we're going to be having a special July 4th. It's on a Sunday this year. We're going to be having a special time of fellowship July 4th. We're going to change things around a little bit. You said you did that Memorial weekend. I know it, and I don't like changing things around. I don't like it so much. I'm going to do it again just to give myself a hard time. I, I give you guys a hard time. I might as well give myself a hard time. Amen? And uh, I told our Sunday school class what we're going to do, and I'll tell the church tonight. So come on back tonight. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 6, I'm going to be talking about the I knows of the Scripture, the I knows of the Scripture. In verse 1, I, let's just grab that real quick. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Amen. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that which we be unclothed, but clothed upon, that morality, uh, mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Father, now prepare our hearts to receive your word. Lord, there are things that we can know. We can know for sure we're going to heaven. We can know that you live in our hearts. Lord, we pray that we'll come to that understanding for those folks who don't have Jesus in their heart. Father, let he, the Holy Spirit, work with their soul and, and let their soul be receptive to the invitation to salvation. Again, we love you and thank you. Fight the devil for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. In our text this morning, Paul is speaking to those who belong to God. He's speaking to his children. If you do not belong to Christ, now listen, please. If you do not belong to Christ, I encourage you to accept him today. Now, this is the most important thing you will ever do in your life. We see commercials on TV, listen to ads on the radio, and, and read about them in, in our uh, printed literature. Is there printed literature out there anymore? I don't know. But uh, uh, they say this is the most important thing in your life. No. Whether or not you are going to heaven is the most important thing in your life. You need that need met only by Jesus Christ. And I encourage you, do not delay, but accept Christ as your Savior. Now, in my Christian life, I've seen many great things God has done. It, even though it shouldn't dumbfound me, sometimes I'm just dumbfounded. Because our God is so great and so mighty and powerful. I never cease to marvel at his faithfulness and his steadfastness. You know, this is something that the people don't understand today in our society. Faithfulness and steadfastness. We can't get people to stick like glue to anything. They're like the Teflon people. I mean, you just slide off from one thing to another. 
And I tell you what, we need to get stuck on Jesus Christ. That's all I'm saying. All things that we think that are real today may very well be changed tomorrow. I mean, they, they tell you to eat eggs today, and then next, next week they'll tell you it's bad. They tell you drink coffee today, next week they'll tell you coffee will kill you, you know. And uh, don't eat meat then the next week they tell you that's all they want you to eat. And, and it's all real and it's all there and everything, but, but everything changes, but not with the Lord. You know, the Scripture teaches us He's the day of the same yesterday, today, and forever. The way to heaven isn't any different than it was when He preached, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The world is full of uncertainty. But there are some things I know. Now, this is the I know of the Scriptures. There are some things I know that will never change. And they come from God Himself. There are things that will never change. Well, if you'll now turn to the book of Job. The book of Job. You say, well, all I have is a New Testament. Well, look in the uh, book racks and you'll see a Bible in there. And you can use that. Uh, Job, and I want to look at chapter 19. Job chapter 19. Here's what Job says. Job's, Job has now listened to his friends, and, and uh, Job has an answer uh, to his life's need. In Job chapter 19, verse 25, this is what Job says. He says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. You know, before Jesus Christ ever ministered on the earth, before the angels in Acts chapter 1 declared as Jesus removed himself out of their sight, if you please levitate it, or rose from the ground up into heaven, and the angels declared to those people that are standing by, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? For the same Jesus, in like manner as you saw him leave, will come again. Way before that happened, Job had this testimony and this walk with God, and he makes this statement, I know that my Redeemer liveth and shall stand on the earth again someday. My friends, this is the faithfulness and the steadfastness of God. God is alive. People question it today. But I want you to know and I want you to be settled in your own mind, in your own spirit, that our Redeemer does live. He is real. He's alive. I don't care how many people out in the world say He doesn't exist. Or if he does exist, he was just a good man. He was more than a good man. He's the Savior of the world. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, I understand something. And I talked about it a little bit in, in Sunday school today. I know that religion is dead. I was listening to a, a, uh, uh, <laughs> a radio Program that was talking about spiritual things. And they were talking about, I believe it was Lebanon. And we used to have missionaries in Lebanon until they kicked them out. And we have one in Lebanon, and they can't kick him out. His name is Brother Noah. They can't kick him out because they need him too bad. And so they say, well, as long as you do your work in our colleges, then we'll let you do. And you know, even though the preaching is banned, he's able to preach God's word. But they were saying on the radio that uh, uh, the people there in Lebanon have become dissatisfied with Muhammad. They've become dissatisfied with their religion. You know why? Because Jesus is the only one who can satisfy the heart. All others is just, is just play. All other things is, is just pretend. But Jesus, as we used to say in the 60s, Jesus is the real thing. Amen? He is the real thing. 
Bible tells us that religion is dead. Over in the book of Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, the Bible says this, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You say, well, man, there's so many religions and so many ways to heaven. No, there are not a lot of religions and there are not a lot of ways to heaven. There's only one truth, and that truth is found in Christ Jesus. He's the truth. And we need to just let all this other garbage go and grab hold of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. There are ways that seemeth right unto mankind. Well, this sounds good to me. Well, it might sound good to you, but it's not good for you, you see, because there are the ways of death. But if you think about what Christ says, his, his faith, His teachings are not dead. Over in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6, He says, Jesus said unto him, he was saying unto Doubting Thomas, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father except by me. You see, there's the real. It's not religion, it's Christianity. It is not dead, it's alive. I was trying to think last night, I, I was as I was figuring out mom's age and everything, Brother Tim, how many years I've, I've walked with the Lord and been saved and... and I, I, I've, I've been saved for 55 years. 55 years I've got to walk with the Lord. And it wasn't anything that I did, but it's what, what God did. He sent His Son to die on the cross. I had preachers and teachers and parents that said, you know, if you're without Jesus Christ, you are not going to heaven. You say, hey, that's not nice. No, it's not nice. I don't want to go to hell. Amen. I want to go to heaven. And they warned me. And when it came time for me to understand, I gladly walked the aisle and let Jesus come into my heart. Oh, He is the way. I know that my Redeemer liveth. All the other uh, personages of all these religions, you can go to their grave and their bones and their, and their bodies are dust there where they were buried they're there but not my Lord that old grave could only hold him for three days and he was out of there and he's, he's waiting for the Father to tell him when to come now for those of us who are saved it is time for us to carry our risen Savior and take our personal Christ to those who are lost in religion. It's our time. It's our duty. You say, but our fathers and our mothers of the past, they are in heaven today. We are God's children too, and we need to take the task at hand. Over in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, is that blessed command that we are to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we ought to do it with a joy in our heart, with a gladness in our step, and a smile on our face. Because we are actually giving people something they can actually use. I have been given gifts that I can't even use. Mainly because the gift is smarter than the gifted. They gave me a gift and it's, I, I can't figure it out. Or maybe there's a gift that, that uh, was given to me that my wife felt like she could use better than me. And uh, so she has it, you know. You, you, you guys know what I mean. You, you, isn't that right? You, you, your wives and stuff, they get a whole lot of your gifts and stuff. Yeah, uh, You're not going to say amen because you're cowards. But uh, uh, we have Christ Jesus to give. Oh, how sad of a day it is when we're so selfish and such a stingy gut that we won't give somebody the best thing that we can give them, the knowledge of God. Oh, communism. Oh, we're seeing communism at hand. I was taught our whole life about communism, the evilness of communism. Uh, Gayla back here, she's older than I am, by the way. 
And, uh, but her daddy, and I don't even know if you had her or not, but he carried in his Bible how communism would come take over America. Do you still have it? Can I get a copy of that? Okay, if you can find it. But Patty, do you remember that? And he used to read it every year to the Niners class. And he, it was written, it wasn't written by him, but it was written by somebody how Satan would bring communism into our nation. And right now, communism is not standing at the porch of our house, of our nation. It has stepped through the door. But communism and worldly programs have proven themselves a failure. They have proven themselves a failure because in it, their whole thought process, there is not a God. But you can try to take God out of the picture, but He drew the picture. He smack dab in the middle of the picture, and He will always be there in the picture. Yeah. The Bible declares to us in the book of Psalms chapter 14 and verse 1. Psalms chapter 14 verse 1. Now this is what the word of God says. It says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. What kind of person has said in their heart there is no God? The fool. I tell you what when we were growing up you didn't say the word fool very often. It was a very serious in the Bible a very serious Back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the, the sitcoms, you would hear the word, you're a fool, and stuff like that. Boy, that didn't go around in our house. We weren't allowed to say that. Because any time that the Bible talked about a fool, it was somebody who was against God. And their foolishness of not accepting God. My friends, we have a bunch of foolishness going on in our world today they say there is no God but you can say there's not but I'm going to tell you what the people who say there's no God is going to stand before him one day nay that's a little Bible talk for you folks that don't know what nay means Up his, uh, I thought that's what a horse says but nay they're going to bow their knees before this God they say it's not real and they are going to confess he is God and they're going to plead and cry and try to excuse their not accepting Jesus Christ. But my friends, today all we have to do is get on our knees if you can. If you can't, where you're sitting, some people are bed bound, laying in your bed, cry out for God's mercy, and He will give you mercy and grace. No, the world's program have, have brought about helplessness and bankruptcy and hopelessness. That's why everybody's so unhappy and so, so miserable and so frustrated. It's because of the world's program. It will never bring happiness. You say, well, if I can get enough money, I'll be happy. You'll never have enough money. If I can get this education that I want, I'll be happy. You'll never have enough education. If I can, if I can, if I can, there will be enough, never enough if to be supplied until you accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Because that old empty heart cannot be filled until God moves in. Now is the time, Christians, to carry the gospel to these poor folks who have lost so much, lost their happiness and their, and their surety in life. Lost, lost their joy. Some of them have lost their family, lost their jobs. They just feel like they've lost life in, in, in general. My friend, this is the time for us to stand up and go out these doors and share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I said before, God is very much alive. We know He is, do we not? We know He's alive. People all over our city and our surrounding communities. They need to hear that our Redeemer liveth. As Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. They need to know that our Redeemer liveth. Amen. We're getting ready to send somebody out of our midst to, to go and, and uh, 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 be a pastor of a church. 
We've got to do that. That's how we get from Jerusalem to Judea, then to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We need to carry to these people in our town and our surrounding areas the hope of the living God who loves and cares for them. You say, nobody loves me. That's a lie. God loves you. God loves you. If nobody in the world would ever love you but God, that suffices that suffices God loves you and he cares for you he cares for them say preacher these people that I work with they're so mean and and so cantankerous and I just don't even want to try have you ever thought if you make them a brother or sister in Christ they'll quit being mean and cantankerous if you would put joy in their heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, that maybe they wouldn't be being a cantankerous? You see, they need our Jesus. When the devil reaches his hand in to defeat Job, and not any of us probably even here today will actually have the hand of Satan himself against us. We might have the hand of his followers, the unclean spirits that he commands but he did not create, those that he commands. But when the devil himself reached his hand in, to defeat Job, Job stayed sound in the Lord. My friends, whatever comes, as those of us who are saved, whatever comes about to us, we have to stand steadfast to the Lord to his ways, to his teachings. We can't give in one iota. We can't let our feet slip because we're supposed to be standing on ground, sure. Amen? Yeah. We need the Lord. You know what Job said about his life? Let's look at Job chapter 19, verse 7. He... he, he he said this, he said, Behold, I cry out of wrong. He says, I cry out, I've been wronged. I've been wronged, but I'm not heard. I cried aloud, but there is no judgment. Have you ever felt this way before? You've been wrong and you cry out, I have been wrong. And you look for somebody to listen to you. I've been wrong. And he looked for judgment. Where's the judge showing that I am innocent? I've been wrong. And even though he'd been wronged, he stayed steadfast. He stayed sure. His feet did not slip one iota. We know his attitude. I know that my Redeemer liveth. He didn't slip. Yes, he'd been wrong. People despised him and rejected him. Oh, my friends, when somebody's down and been down for a while, it seems like folks, instead of having that compassionate heart, they begin to despise. They begin to despise. And he felt that, that his friends and family started to despise him. Because I believe in their heart, their heart they believed he was guilty of something. And he was guilty of nothing. He said, I've been wronged. In verse 13, it says this. He hath put my brethren far from me, and my acquaintances are verily estranged to me. Nobody's coming around. My kinfolks have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in my house and my maids Count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. These people are supposed to serve me and help me. I, they, they avoid me. I called my servant and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. And as he called, that, that servant wouldn't come to him. He tried to entreat him, please come to me, come to my aid. Please, I need help. But yet, they ignored him. My breath is a stranger, is strange to my wife. 
Though I treated for the children's sake of my own body. His wife, bless her heart, she was so discouraged. You say, well, Job lost all these things. He lost his house and he lost his children. He lost. She did too. His wife lost the same thing that he lost. But she didn't lose his, her health. Don't you know the heartbreak of that lady? And she's so heartbroken. And when he called, she didn't even want to answer. He says, Yea, young children, despise me. I arose, and they spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. He's a broken man. But yet, in the next few words, we see him say this, and I want to remind you again. <coughs> Verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. In all of his bad, his Redeemer liveth. Not just in heaven, but in his own personal life. Though I'm forsaken by friends and families, by servants, <coughs> and by strangers, <coughs> he's saying, I am not forsaken by my God. Oh, he was wrongly treated. Yes, he was despised. Yes, he seemed all alone. His children were killed where they could not come to his aid. But yet, Job worshiped God in this in this book of Job chapter 1 would you just join me this is going to be my last verse Job chapter 1 as we proceed from going to the first of Job chapter 1 down we see that in 18 and 19 well 13 on down through 19 we see the story of how Job started losing things in his life. My friends, if you're living for the things in your life, you're going to find yourself wanting. If all that means to you is things, they say the one who dies with the most toys wins. No, that is not true. The one who dies with the Lord in their heart, they're the ones that win. He said this, he lost them all. In verse 20, after getting all this information all at one time, here's what he said in verse 20. Then Job arose, and he rent his mantle, and he shaved his head, and he fell down on the ground, and he worshipped. What would you do? Be honest with yourself. What would you do if everything that you own that was, even if it's not much, if it was, if it, you labored for it and, and you worked hard and it was taken from you, and then the children that you had, all your children were taken from you, and then your health is taken from you, what would you do? Most people say, well, if this way God's going to treat me, I'm not serving him anymore. I see it today. I know of a man who is, supposed, who is supposed to walk close to the Lord. He's so fed up, he says, I'm done with God. <clears throat> Foolish. You say, well, you haven't walked in his shoes. No, I have not. But I know a God that's faithful to me. And at the very least, I need to be faithful to him. I don't know what you would do today. I don't know what I would do today, but I hope I would have the spirit of Job in me. Where I get down on my knees. He took off his fine clothes. He shaved his head. I don't have to shave very much anymore. 
getting less. But he went to his knees and he worshiped the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He worshiped that which is truth, that which is real. I know that my Redeemer lives. Let me ask you something does the Redeemer live in your heart? If he doesn't, today is the day of salvation. Those who are listening to me from the computer, do you know for a fact that if you died right now, that you'd go to heaven? If you don't, today is the day of salvation. Oh, the devil wants to get you distracted about thinking about other things. He doesn't want you to think right now about your, your spiritual existence. But I'm here to tell you right now, you have a spiritual existence. And we want it to be heaven. God wants it to be heaven. The Father, He sent His Son so you could have your eternal existence in heaven. But you've got to accept Christ the Savior. You can't just do good works and hope to get to heaven because you won't make it. You'll die and go to hell. You can't hope your way to heaven because God has given a specific plan on how to get saved. You say, well... I'm just going to trust that maybe I'll get there. I tell you what, you need to trust, yes, but you can get there if you'll see yourself as the great sinner you are. You come to that knowledge that Jesus died for you, was buried and rose again. The Bible says it, uh, with Jesus, he, he, he began his ministry and he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, confess Christ Jesus. Accept Him as Savior. And the Bible says, anyone that will come to Him, He will in no wise cast out. So oh, I'm bad. You're not so bad, you can't be saved. Oh, I'm just worthless. You're not so worthless that Christ left heaven to come to save you. Say, well, nobody cares. Yet God does. He wants you saved. Today, He wants you saved. Don't delay. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Get saved today. Christians, let us take the Word, the truth of God, to these poor folks who maybe don't really have an understanding what living is. You do what you're supposed to do. God will do what he's supposed to do and people will come to Jesus. Let's all stand with our head bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. I know of the Bible. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And for a fact, he does. What are you going to do with God? What are you going to do with God's love? Are you going to accept him or are you going to reject him?